advantage. So sorry, guys, we broke your agenda for tonight. But the great thing is that God has his own agenda, right? Amen. So welcome all of you who are not a full gospel. Welcome and feel at home tonight. We welcome the pastors that are here. We'll introduce them in a moment. And we welcome uh, Aaron Lipton today. He's going to be ministering and uh, telling us what's going on. Some exciting things happening in Israel that we wanted to share with you guys. And his son, Evie, has traveled with, with him. He's been here for about a month and a half in the States. And so we're really excited to have, and we, um, we welcome you tonight. Amen. But before we start um, speaking, or he starts speaking, we have uh, two pastors uh, in our midst, and i just like to introduce them. And so the first pastor is Pastor Deborah Mitchell. And she has been in full-time ministry for about 40 years. She is the pastor of Love and Mercy Fellowship here on Long Island for 27 years. She produced and edited the radio programs for, for Vision of the Lost for 15 years and hosted this uh, radio show called Close to the Heart for 22 years. She is now the acting president of Hope for the Futures. Since Pastor Diane uh, Dunn's uh, passing, many of you know Pastor Diane, but she is in glory right now, right? And so Hope for the Futures, a ministry that feeds the homeless and the poor in New York City and Long Island. She's a worshiper at heart with deep love for the Hebraic roots of Christianity and a teacher of the Hebrew language. So if anybody wants to learn Hebrew, we can ask Pastor Deborah. And we'll introduce have her come up here in a moment, but I also wanted to introduce uh, Pastor Susan Pellegrini, and many of you may already know her, but Pastor uh, Pellegrini is a pastor of Hactiva Fellowship, a, a Hebrew roots ministry. She's a wife, she's a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. Pastor Susan has been prophetically teaching the scriptures for over 40 years in different churches in Long, in Long Island and conferences. She has visited Israel many times and organized several tour groups, including one with Aaron's tour company, and Aaron will probably tell you a little bit about that. Pastor Susan has also introduced and taught the tambourine ministry to many churches on Long Island, including right here in Full Gospel. She has taught her tambourine ministry and in conferences all around Long Island. So I'd like to introduce Susan, who's going to have uh, Pastor Deborah come up, and then uh, finally we'll, we'll get to our main speaker tonight. So Pastor Susan, come up, and we welcome you. Hello. It's been a lot of years, oh, hello. Been a lot of years since I've been here, but it's, it's great to be here. And I wanted uh, to introduce, Pastor Debbie was introduced, but uh, she has something to share with you. So before we start, we're gonna ask you to come up and share something about hope for the future. If you know, uh, Pastor Diane Dunn, I'm sure many of you, so. First of all, it's an honor to be here, and uh, I thank you. Um, as Y'all heard my name is Deborah, Pastor Deborah from Love and Mercy, and now Hope for the Future. And we have an opportunity, uh, an open door with the Mets. How many love helping the poor? How many have ever helped the poor? How many like to have fun doing it? <laughs> yes. Well, we have an opportunity uh, through the Mets, believe it or not. Uh, they've opened up a number of seats, a few, three sections for three of their ball games uh, this year uh, for Hope for the Future to receive a proceed from each ticket purchased. The tickets are $40 and Hope for the Future will get $10 for each ticket. It's not about whether or not you're a Mets fan because I'm not. <laughs> It's not even about whether or not you're a sports fan, because really, I'm not. <laughs> Only when I have to be. <laughs> but it's about, it's about helping the poor. And so I have here uh, a flyer that shows you the dates. All the dates involved are either a fireworks night or a bobblehead giveaway. And so it's it going to prove to be a, a fun time. Even if you don't go in yourself, you, I'm sure you know somebody that you can bless with a, a gift of a few tickets. And, and they can go in and have an enjoyable time and you can be helping the poor at the same time. And it's a, a matter of going on to our website at hopeforthefuture.com and clicking on the link on our website. The flyer, <clears throat> the flyer has all the information 
and uh, this way you get to the proper place. And you, yes, yeah, so if you could, may I? Yeah, okay. Yes, thank you so much. And there's thank more you. here if you need. Thank you so much. And again, I know tonight is going to be a very enjoyable night uh, if you have a heart for Israel. One of the other things that I thought was awesome about the, uh, the Mets doing that, the Mets doing that, and I thought, boy, they have a certain seat, certain section that they gave, and what a, what a witness to see it filled with, with Christians who, who are coming to, to give their money to feed the poor. They're making the effort, the Mets. So I thought that was something to make an effort. And like Pastor Debbie said, if you can go, you can gift some tickets. And this way we hopefully fill up the place and, and make a showing. So, so with that, it is my honor to have to introduce Aaron for the second time this week. <laughs> We've been friends for a long time, and his dad, we go, we go way back. And um, very special family. We love them very much. And uh, he spoke last night at Pastor Debbie's church. And so a lot, some who were there came here because it was that good. And you, you might need to hear it like 45 times before you even remember anything about it or even understand anything, but it doesn't matter. But one of the things that when I introduce him or his dad or, or other biblical Jews, we call them biblical Jews, I want to make something clear and there's a reason. Now, uh, one of the things Aaron does is he is a... He brings Jews and, and Gentiles together. He does a dialogue. He did this in Israel. He brought for the first time rabbis who were very hurt by Christians and very anti-Christian and some other <laughs> Christians who didn't really deal too much with Jews. And he started a dialogue. And now there's, there's a real good dialogue going on. So one of the ways that Christians and Jews can have a dialogue and understand each other is to understand each other, is to understand how they think, what they, you know, what they believe. And um, so the way I like to introduce what I call biblical Jews, he's not a Messianic Jew. And that's something you, you, you're going to have to wrap your brain around after you hear him. Because we have a mindset, Christians have a mindset, Jews have a mindset, Christians have a mindset. But he is not a Messianic Jew. Uh, he's, yeah, not a Messianic Jew, and he's not a Christian. He is an Orthodox Jew, and he loves God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God has made a promise to Jews who love God with their whole mind and strength that he will be found of them. So if anybody wants to pray for Aaron to find what we found... Yeshua is our Messiah. He has no objection. But at this point, he's doing good. He's doing good because God made a promise to him, and he's going to enter into that. So uh, Pastor Debbie used a scripture last night that I want to use again from Zechariah. In that day, ten men, women of all the nations, which are Gentiles, will grab the hold of a Jew and say, let us go with you because we know God is with you. And so the Jews are still have a very special role to do in this hour, in this day, and really in the church, because he's bringing the understanding of Israel and of a Jew, because God has not ever broken covenant with his people, and he will bring them to the place he wants them to be at the time he wants them to be there, so we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry. We just let God have your way. So with that, I'm going to introduce my dear friend, wonderful Aaron Lipton, Lipkin, to come up and share everything and anything you want to share. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Good. Shalom. Shalom. Thank you so much for hosting us. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, we uh, landed on May 10th, and um, uh, my son and I are really enjoying ourselves, but also um, we're really looking forward to going back to Israel. <laughs> it's kind of like it's every time we come here for a month, a month and a half, it's always the, the, the middle. There's a crisis in the middle where we're like, ah, we're waiting to get back home. So, um, uh, so um, I, I just put a post on Facebook 
with a, with a song of love for my wife because I miss her so much. So uh, yeah, hopefully soon we will be reunited. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely a great experience to be here in the States and, and you know, we, we flew from Israel to um, Colorado. We participated in a prophecy conference in Colorado Springs. Uh, we spoke both in churches and synagogues, TV stations, radio stations. And um, what I'm going to share with you tonight is, is such, such an uh, amazing news. Um, you know, I always tell to, to people that without any humility and modesty, I, I'm aware of that, uh, one day my grand-grandchildren are going to go into the Israel Museum in Jerusalem and they're going to point out to their grandchildren, uh, you see that small piece of lead behind the window, that glass window? Your grandfather found that. So, so and, I, and I'm going to be enjoying it um, when I'm 200 years old at my, at my home when they come back and they say, Grandpa, we saw it. Hopefully, it's not a shame. Anyway, um, I want to, uh, to share um, for a few testimonies first about uh, my life and you know, speak about myself. But uh, we are who we are, not, because, not just because of God, but also because of our parents. So I'll, I'll speak a bit about my parents. Uh, my father is an American-born Jew uh, from Great Neck Estates in New York. Yes. Um, the family came from Europe in the early 1900s, and they traveled to Argentina, from Argentina to the United States, from the United States back to Argentina, and then back to the United States. It's the Jewish story. And uh, my father was born in Great Neck, New York, and um, he grew up in a very secular family. Um, they didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in the Bible. Um, but they were very um, strongly connected to the Jewish people, the Jewish heritage, the Jewish the language, the Yiddish. Uh, and, uh, you know, my father was sent to Sunday school and to, to synagogue. And um, one day when my father is 14 years old, he sees an article in the newspaper that our first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, is saying that all Jews have to come and live in Israel. My father, an American Jew, was angry at the Prime Minister of Israel. Why can't I be a Jew, a good Jew in America? Why do I have to come to Israel? So um, he went to his Hebrew school teacher and asked him to help him write a letter to the Prime Minister of Israel. This is, my, this is 14 years old. So this letter flies to Israel and, you know, the Prime Minister of Israel is, you know, handling wars and economic strife and, you know, immigration and, you know, so many problems. And, and suddenly he gets this letter and he stops everything, you know, I need, I need a few minutes here. And he sits down and he writes an answer to my dad. We have two letters from Israel's Prime Minister, Ben Gurion, uh, and he's basically telling my father, you can be a good Jew in America. But if you want to be a complete Jew, you have to come to Israel. <laughs> so um, my father uh, receives a direct command from the Prime Minister of Israel, and he decides to immigrate to Israel in 1969, following the Six-Day War. Okay, we all know the Six-Day War, 1967, June. Israel um, goes into a Six-Day War, <laughs> and the end of that war, we find ourselves suddenly with the Sinai and the, and the Golan Heights and the biblical heartland of Israel, Judea and Samaria, and most importantly, Jerusalem is united. After 19 years of, of Jordanian occupation, we're able to reunite our eternal capital and, and, and visit the old city, visit Temple Mount. And so my father was so much affected by this amazing historical event that he said to his parents, I'm going to Israel. So 1969, my father comes to Israel. My mom, on the other hand, is an Egyptian Jewess from Cairo, Egypt. Um, and uh, my, my, my mom and her family didn't want to leave Egypt. They wanted to stay in Egypt. And 
1948, Israel declares independence. There is a war. You have an immigration of Jews from Egypt to Israel. And then 1956, another war, another immigration. But my family in Cairo sticks to Cairo. They don't want to go to Israel. They're, they're very strongly attached to Egypt. And um, when the Six-Day War breaks, they hear a knock on the door. And um, my mom goes to open the door, and an Egyptian officer goes in. And he uh, asks my grandfather to come with him for a five-minute interrogation. And that's, that becomes two years in prison, uh, along with the rest of the Jewish men that were left in Egypt. They were tortured, humiliated. My grandfather never spoke about what happened in prison. Only after his passing away, um, there was a book that was published and even an article written by an Egyptian reporter about what happened in that prison. And I'm, I'm not going to share with you, but it's, it's terrible. Um, the family was deported after two years to France. My grandfather immediately applied for green cards to the United States. And um, he got the green cards. He got the approval. And he comes home happy. And he says, we're going to America. And then my grandmother, this is an Egyptian Middle Eastern family, OK? My grandmother stands up to my grandfather and says, no, we're going to Israel. Enough is enough. We're going home. And my grandfather is shocked. And he says, OK, let me sleep one night and think about it, because he needs to make the decision, right? And uh, the next day, he says, we're going to Israel. And the family goes to Israel. My parents meet in Jerusalem. Here I am. <laughs> and uh, I, I uh, thank you. Louder, louder. <laughs> so, so I grew up in Jerusalem, um, the capital of Israel. And we are a traditional Jewish family, which means we're not um, religious. We're not very observant of the laws. But on the other hand, I, I believe in God. I believe in the Bible. I believe in all the stories that are mentioned in the Bible. And um, I remember going with my parents to my grandfather's house my, and my, my grandmother's house in Batyam, at the coastal area of Israel. And um, one of those experiences I want to share with you is, is, is what really made me a strong believer in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're in the living room. And we're talking about uh, Israel and politics and the security situation and economy and whatever. And suddenly, my grandfather goes like this. And the whole family quiets down. And he's looking at the ceiling. This is the living room, OK? He's looking at the ceiling. And he's starting to pray to God in Arabic. Because Arabic is the language that he knew from Egypt. It was the most the language he felt comfortable with. But he's, he's, he's praying to God to keep Israel and to guide our prime minister and our president and, 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 and keep our soldiers. And, and I remember sitting there as a kid in the living room and learning from my grandfather that God is everywhere. God is even in our living room. I can speak to him anywhere I want. And uh, from that point on, I did. I mean. I spoke to God constantly, complained a lot, by the way. <laughs> and, and so this is definitely something that was uh, engraved in my, uh, in my soul. Um, the other thing that happened, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, yeah. Uh, the, other, the other thing that, uh, that happened is. My thumbprint. OK. The other thing that, uh, that happened is um, um, I, uh, sorry. No, no, it's OK, it's OK. I, the other thing that happened is my parents bought me a, um, a series of books for the Bible, an illustrated Bible for the children. And I remember receiving it as a, as a kid, in, in, I guess in my second grade or third grade. And I started reading through those books. and. It's like you see these animated pictures of the biblical heroes, and in the background you see the real pictures of where these stories happened. And so I'm reading this, and I'm, 
I'm with Jacob, I'm with Abraham, I'm with Isaac, I'm with Moses. I'm standing with Ezekiel and seeing these angels and everything was so real to me. And so when, we, when I went to, to, to junior, to elementary school, uh, we had Bible class. It's mandatory for Jews, Jewish schools in Israel to learn Bible. That's good, right? Okay, so, so I went, I went to, to elementary school and, and my, my teacher made a mistake by accepting me to her class. And, and, and suddenly, you know, she says, we're going to talk about Abraham. And I'm like, I know, I know. And then I'm talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, so everybody. And, and she's, she's like, you know, Aaron, I need to, to teach here. So, you know, let me, let me talk. I was the best student in class just because of these books. And um, then I went to high school. And in high school, we have Bible class, right? Good, right? Are you sure? Okay. My high school was a secular high school. Okay, so I'm going into my, my Bible class, and my teacher is standing in front of us. She's saying, we're going to start learning the book of Genesis. And I'm like, I know, Genesis. And then she stands there and she says, the book of Genesis is a collection of mythologies from Assyria and Babylon that were um, taken by the Israelites and manipulated to fit monotheism. And by the way, the rest of the books of the Bible, well, they're written by different scribes in different times in history, much later than the supposedly time of writing it in Mount Sinai. And I'm sitting there and I can't believe what I'm hearing, because first of all, it's not what I, what I, what I, uh, what I heard from, from my parents. It's not what, what I was brought up on. I'm, I'm sitting in a, in a Jewish school, secular school, but still Jewish, secular school in Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel, in the land of Israel, the land of the Bible, and my teacher is telling me that my Torah is not even mine. I mean, we took it from the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and we manipulated it. But wait, isn't it from God? I mean, what's going on here? I, I, was, so, I was so mixed up, and, and I, was, I was a believer in God. I had other friends in class that didn't believe in God. They, that was their first encounter with, with the Bible, and, and that's, that's what they got from my teacher. I, I, I just couldn't believe it. Well, finished high school, and uh, the first thing you do after you finish high school is you go to the army. It's mandatory in Israel. Because I spoke Arabic at home, my mother is Egyptian, my grandfather prayed to God in Arabic, I know Arabic. So the Israeli army, the intelligence corps immediately takes me, and they put me in a very top secret uh, unit that monitors Arab broadcasts. Uh, I can't say more because I'll have to kill you. But, but, but it was an amazing, amazing service. But I think that the, the best thing that, uh, that happened to me in the army service is that I met my wife, Etty. Uh, she saw this handsome soldier, <laughs> and I say intelligent as well, and, uh, and she, uh, she approached me and she started asking me questions about my hobbies didn't have any, any, any interest in my hobbies, obviously. Uh, and uh, the next thing I know, she's proposing. And, and I said, yes. And I, I, I'm not kidding you, she did propose. And I said, yes, and we got married. And um, uh, we have uh, five beautiful children. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, you know, we're going to university. Obviously, we it took time until we had five children, okay? <laughs> so so uh, we got married in the army, uh, started Hebrew University, and I'm working at a lawyer's office. And uh, I'm, I'm sitting there, and this, this, this girl coming up to me, this red-headed girl, and she's saying, Aaron, I see that you're wearing a, a kippah on your head. So I, I understand you're religious, you believe in God. I want to tell you that I'm learning archeology span in the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and um, what we're learning there is that the Exodus never happened. 
and, and Moses, Joshua, fiction figures. They never existed. So, you know, I'm sorry to break the news to you. And then she's going, and, and she's leaving me with this, sorry, worthless piece of information. And, and I'm saying to myself, what's going on here? The land of the Jews, the educational system, the, the, the academic system in the land of Israel is teaching me that my heritage, my faith, is a big lie. You understand? And, and this is not only in Israel. This is happening all over the world, in all the college, colleges. Our children are being taught that Christianity and Judaism are based on a big lie. Every Passover Seder, I'm celebrating fake news. I'm celebrating an event that never happened. For thousands of years, that's what we've been doing, right? So, you know, you're frustrated, you can't do anything, you continue your life. And um, one day I, um, I walk in the streets of Jerusalem and I see an ad, and the ad says, Professor of Archaeology, Adam Zertal is going to be speaking about his discovery of Joshua's altar. And I'm looking at this, and it's not, it's something's, go wrong, something's wrong in this ad because I see a professor of archaeology from the Haifa University talking about him discovering a site that's described in the Bible. So what's going on here? That's not what I'm used to. So I have to go. I have to see what he says. And, um, and I do. And uh, I go into this uh, lecture hall, and this gentleman that you see behind me, Professor Adam Zertal, is uh, standing there, sorry, not standing, sitting, because he was, um, uh, um, he, had, he had crutches, he was wounded in the Yom Kippur War, and he's sitting there, and he's showing this amazing slide with lectures about a, a real archaeological find that convinced him that the Bible is true, that the history that's described there did really happen. Um, but before I'm going to, to, to go into that, we have to understand what Joshua's altar is. What is this ceremony that we're talking about? So I'm going to briefly show the verses. I'm not going to read all of them. Uh, you're more than invited to read them behind me or read them in your Bibles or at home. But what we're going to talk about in the next few minutes is a ceremony, a very important ceremony that's commanded by Moses not once, but twice in the book of Deuteronomy. Once in Deuteronomy 11, once in Deuteronomy 27, and then the ceremony appears again in the book of Joshua in chapter 8. Three times total in the Bible this ceremony is mentioned. And what is mentioned? Moses is commanding the Israelites to go into the land, and as they enter to the land, immediately do a ceremony, a national ceremony, where there are two mountains, Mount Ibal and Mount Gerizim. And they are to proclaim the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curses on Mount Ibal. And then, again in Deuteronomy 11, Moses gives them a very specific GPS pinpoint location of where that is. And it's, it's westward toward the way of the setting of the sun near the great trees of Moreh. And the Israelites hear the trees of Moreh immediately. They know where it is. It's near the city of Shechem where Abraham was. We know that place. Then in Deuteronomy 27, Moses repeats the commandment, but this time in length. The first commandment that they need to do, the first the first action they need to do is to build a memorial on Mount Ibal. That memorial needs to be stones that are taken from the Jordan to Mount Ibal. We need to plaster them. We need to write on them. And we need to set these stones on Mount Ibal. We see the plaster. We see the writing. And we continue the same chapter. We have another commandment to build an altar on which mountain? Mount Ibal, which is the mountain of curse. 
Interesting. Um, and this, this altar, this altar of stones, has to be made out of uncut stones, okay? Not stones that were taken and cut and made like these beautiful, perfect shape. No, you take the field stones as they, are, as they appear in nature and you use them to build this structure. Um, we're going to be burning burnt offerings on them and fellowship offerings. We're going to be rejoicing and we're going to write, okay? You notice the word write, it repeats itself constantly. Next, we're going to have the whole nation of Israel there, half the tribes on one side, half the tribes on the other. We're going to have the Levites in the middle, and the Levites are going to be uh, basically screaming a list of blessings and curses. Okay? Now, the Bible doesn't mention the blessings but it does mention the curses, okay? And let's just look at these curses for one second. The first curse is, Cursed is anyone who makes an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord, the work of skilled hands, and sets it up in secret. Then all the people shall say, Amen. What does this remind you? The Ten Commandments. Okay, that's the first commandment. What's the second curse? Cursed is anyone who dishonors their father and their mother. Also, Ten Commandments. So, what, what is the Bible telling us here? It's telling us that we have a second Mount Sinai in the land of Israel. We are receiving the commandments. We are um, vowing to God that we will be loyal to His commandments. And so, this is what the Israelites are, are, are understanding here. And this goes on and on. Twelve curses... By the way, curse in Hebrew is arur. That's the word, arur, cursed, and it's in the singular for, for, form. Okay? In Hebrew, you have singular and plural. So, arur is singular, singular. And it ends with, cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of this law by carrying them out, then all the people shall say, Amen. So these are the 12 curses that are being shouted in front of the Israelites, and the Israelites, you, you, you got to close your eyes and, and imagine this. All the nation of Israel is shouting Amen. The whole country was trembling from this sound, from this huge ceremony. Moses passes away. Joshua becomes the leader of the Israelites. He enters into the land of Israel, and after conquering Jericho and Ai, goes to perform the ceremony that Moses commanded him. And again, what do we see? Joshua builds an altar on Mount Ebal, the mountain of curse. Okay, we're going to be sacrificing uncut stones and fellowship. We're going to be sacrificing uh, uh, fellowship offerings and burnt offerings. We're going to have uh, um, uh, the foreigners there. The Ark of the Covenant was there. We have the native born and with the foreigners. Everybody, everybody is there. And, and not, just, not just them, but also the children, the women, everybody. This, the, Mount Sinai and this ceremony are the only ceremonies where all the Israelites are convened in one central place. And this is also the last time, the last time that the Israelites are convening in one place. From that point on, it's not going to happen. How do we build a stone altar? In the book of Exodus, it says, If you make an altar of stones for me, do not build it with dressed stones, for you will defile it if you use a tool on it. And do not go up to my altar on steps, or your private parts may be exposed. So we're, we have two principles for building a stone altar. One is uncut stones. The second, no stairs, has to be something else that leads up to the altar. So, did the ceremony happen? Did the ceremony happen? Yes. Yes. It did? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Well, some people don't think like you. Um, they're called the minimalists, or as I call them, the minimalists. 
Historians acknowledge that after more than two centuries of archaeological research, there is still an absence of evidence for the presence of Israel in Egypt. Okay, so in other words, there is an absence of evidence, therefore, it didn't happen. Okay, we went into the temples of Egypt, we looked at the pharaoh's tombs, and we didn't find any pharaoh that said that he lost to the Israelites. That there were ten plagues that totally destroyed the land. Weird, isn't it? The pharaohs are not describing their loss. Okay. It is hard to accept, but scholars today are convinced that Israel was not present in Egypt, nor wandered in Sinai. They did not conquer Canaan, nor inherited it to the twelve tribes. And the Israelites, Israelite religion did not adopt monotheism on Mount Sinai, but at the end of the monarchical period. So it's not just Egypt. We weren't in the desert. We never invaded into Canaan. We never conquered Canaan. So who are we? Oh, we're Canaanites. We came from the cities. We rebelled against the Canaanite warlords and, and rebelled against them and ran away to the mountains and established this kingdom, an Israelite kingdom that was pagan. That's, that's what's going on in the academic world. By the way, you want to hear another interesting thing? Because they didn't find any writings from the time of the Israelites, the Israelites were also illiterate. Okay? There's an absence of evidence, so it didn't happen. Okay, that's, that's the academic view. How do we know that the Egyptians knew how to write? Easy. You go into the temples, you look all over, and you see it's writing all over. You go to Assyrian Babylon, you have cuneiform tablets with these engravings on them. They know how to read and write. Yeah. But the Israelites? No. Why not, by the way? <laughs> what do they write on? What do Israelites write on? Parchments. What happens to parchments after hundreds of years? But there's an absence of evidence, so, sorry, we didn't find any ancient Israelite writing from 3,300 years ago, so we're sorry. They didn't know how to write. The problem is that absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, right? Amen. You're not going to find proof for every single event or fact that happened in the Bible, right? But for the academic world, that doesn't matter. And you know why? Because the academic world has an agenda. And the agenda, or should I say their religion, is a religion of atheism. It's a religion that doesn't believe in God, that doesn't believe in providence, that doesn't believe in miracles, that doesn't believe in good or bad. They don't even know what a woman is. <laughs> There's no, no facts, nothing. It's like we're living in a very weird time in the world. Anyway, it's not just the agenda, OK? They have an agenda, but it's not just the agenda. There is a problem. And the problem is that people are looking for evidence. People want to see clear physical evidence for things that happened in the past, in the Bible. But what's the problem? The problem is that most of all the stories in the Bible happen in a very specific area in the land of Israel. That area is called Judea and Samaria. It's the biblical heartland of Israel. It's where Hebron is. Remember, you know Hebron? It's where Bethel is. Shiloh. Elon Moreh, Mount Gerizim, Shechem. All the places that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all the Israel, where the Israelites were, where the judges were, where the Samuel were, that's all in one place. And that place, guess what? It was never researched. You understand? The academic world is saying that there is an absence of evidence, but you didn't even research it. 1948, Israel declares independence. Eight Arab armies attack us. Who wins? Israel. Can you believe what an amazing miracle? Eight Arab armies 
and we win. But there's one Arab army that doesn't lose, and that is the Jordanian army. They invade from the east bank of the Jordan River to the west bank of the Jordan River. They take Judea and Samaria and East Jerusalem, and Israel loses control over the biblical heartland of Israel. So we didn't have any control over that area from 1948 till 1967, and then the Six Day War. Amazing a miracle, we suddenly have these biblical cities, these areas under our grasp, and the archaeologists are frantic. We can go and research that place, but we don't know what's going to happen. Maybe they're going to return it to the Jordanians. Maybe they're going to, we don't know what's going to happen. So Israel declares an emergency archaeological survey of that area that, again, was uncharted, that it was never thoroughly archaeologically researched. And Professor Adams Rital, remember him? His crew, um, let's see, okay, his crew uh, receives a very specific area in the land of Israel, and their mission is to survey. Okay, I'm stopping for a second. Crash course in archaeology. There are two stages. One, the survey. You walk with people, 10 people, maybe more, maybe less, and you're looking for any ancient evidence of human, ancient human activity. Walls, pottery shirts, um, um, uh, you know, stones that were cut for agricultural purposes, anything. And when they get to a place like that, they pick up the pottery, the pottery shirts, and they look at them and they see, oh, this, these are five pottery shirts from the Roman period. So they write on the map, we found five pieces of pottery shirts from the Roman period. And they continue on, and they find another site. And again, they see Persian pottery, they write on the map, and so on and so forth. They create a whole map of to whole regions in Judea and Samaria with a very clear indication of when these sites were used during the very long history of Israel. This is the first stage. The second stage, an archaeologist that specializes in the Persian period, takes that map, opens it, and looks for places that have Persian pottery. And then he says, I'm going to excavate here. And he goes with his crew, and they excavate from top to bottom until they get to the bedrock. And they document every layer and every finding. That's the second stage. And so Adam Zertal and his crew get the area of the Jordan Valley. You see that brown area? Um, so the Jordan Valley from the, the, the Dead Sea in the south almost to the Galilee Sea, to the city of Beit She'an, and westward into the mountains of Samaria. And what they find is remarkable. What they, what they, what they see there is something that was never ever documented or found in the past. It's weird. When you research a place that was never researched, you find things, <laughs> right? So I'm just going to share a few of the important findings and, uh, and then go on to our main topic. So the first, the first, um, the first discovery is quite an interesting thing that we don't know how to explain. At the Late Bronze Age, roughly the years 1500 to 1300 BCE, the Jordan Valley is empty. Nobody's living there, it's a desert. I'm telling you, if you come to Israel and you're standing in May, June, or July in the Jordan Valley, at 9 a.m., you'll run away to the air conditioning after one minute. I kid you not, okay? This is the Late Bronze Age. Nothing's happening there. Suddenly, in the early Iron Age, hundreds of settlements appear from nowhere in the Jordan Valley. They didn't come from the west, from inside of Israel. They just appeared in the Jordan Valley. And where are these settlements? There are these semi-nomadic stone sheep pens 
that the tents were, were located around them and the livestock was inside the sheep pen. And you have hundreds of them suddenly appearing in the Jordan Valley, right at the time where believers say that the Israelites came into the land. Weird. Okay? May I say that you are seeing the archaeological proof for the invasion of Joshua and the Israelites into the land of Israel. Okay? Another interesting discovery are six mysterious footprint structures that were found in the Jordan Valley and on the mountains of Samaria. And I have to tell you, I, I can't say a lot about that because that's not the topic of our lecture, but this topic is, is, is a lecture of itself, and maybe next time if I come in October, we'll talk about that. But, but what, what, what Adam Zertal and his crew found is the ancient worshiping sites of the Israelites. Okay, so as Joshua comes in, they are worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in a place that looks like a footprint. Okay, why is it a footprint? Why is this, why is this shape of a foot? Why are they located near slopes? Why are these slopes all go in the direction of of the Jabbok Pass, okay? All of these stories, but we won't talk about that, okay? Um, it's all in here, by the way. Footsteps of God. But I will talk about one of those footprint structures. Adam Zertal is walking with his crew in 1980 on the slopes of Mount Ival, okay? Remember Mount Ival, right? Yeah. Okay, for us, that's the place where Joshua built the altar, right? But for Adam Zertal, an atheist, socialist, leftist, <laughs> secular, professor of archaeology, that never happened. He's just walking on the mountain, surveying, looking for archaeological evidence from any period, and documenting it. He doesn't have any preconceptions. He's just going in like a blank slate, is that how you call it? Yeah. And suddenly he bumps into a weird compound, okay? This weird compound has the shape of a footprint, just like the ones he found earlier. And we, when he goes inside, he finds thousands and thousands of early Iron Age pottery. You can't say Israelite, by the way. If you say Israelite, you're biased, okay? So it's early Iron Age. You can say Philistine pottery, you can say Canaanite pottery, you can say Persian pottery, but the, there's no thing as in Israelite pottery. So he goes in and he finds Israelite pottery. And I'm holding in my hand pieces of pottery from that compound in my hand. What I'm holding right now are the rims of a colored rim jar, which is the typical Israelite jar for carrying liquids. When you find this in sites in Israel, you know that the Israelites were there. Okay, I'm going to pass this. This is, these, these are, are made by my ancestors 3,300 years ago Maybe even Joshua touched one of these. Okay, so I'm just going to pass these back and please don't forget to return them to me. So Adam Zertal is going in and he sees thousands of these pottery shirts laying on the floor. And um, to tell you a story first, before the next slide. Remember my wife? Yes. So um, my wife... I'm half Egyptian, half American Jew. She's half Moroccan and half Yemenite. My mother-in-law is a Yemenite Jew. And there's one thing I didn't know when I got married to my wife, and that is that Yemenite Jews don't celebrate birthdays. Okay? I, and now, I, the first year passed, I thought maybe she forgot. You know, we're just newlywed. Second year, third year. 
and nothing's happening. <laughs> so I, it's, I'm 40 years old. We're at my mother-in-law's house. And I say to my wife, Etty, I've suffered enough. <laughs> I'm 40 years old. Please celebrate my birthday. Please buy me a present. So my mother-in-law looks at me with her the terrible mistake at my mother-in-law's house. But she's looking at me, and she's saying, Aaron, you know who celebrated their birthday in the Bible? I said, who? She said, Pharaoh. When Joseph got the dreams from Pharaoh, that was Pharaoh's birthday. You want to be evil like Pharaoh? I said, yes. <laughs> I want a present. So my wife says, what do you want? And I said, I want a drone. She says, how much does this drone cost? And I said, $1,500. So she said, not a dime. So I said, can I crowdfund for it? She said, sure. You won't, you won't succeed anyway. And she's a skeptic. But I did. So I got my first drone when I was 40 years old. I have uh, three more drones at the house right now. But, uh, but I want to share with you a drone video that I took of the footprint structure on Mount Ibal that Adam Zertal found. And uh, what you see is one of our groups that's visiting Joshua's altar. And you can see them standing there so you can get an idea of how big it is. And uh, Adam Zertal, let's imagine that we're Adam Zertal. This is 1980. He's entering this mysterious compound, and he's walking, and he's finding these thousands of pottery shirts laying on the ground. And uh, when he continues on, he, he takes this paper, and he starts sketching um, the outline of this structure. And what we see is an outer wall, an outline, and inside, we have another compound. There's a compound and an inner compound. Okay, you see like this church, and you have inside there the booth, which is the Holy of Holies right there. Okay, so, so we, have, we have a compound, and we have stairs leading from one area inside the compound to the other. And at the highest point of that compound is a pile of stone. Who here was in Israel? in the past. Okay, lots of people. So when you go to Israel, you see a lot of stones. Everywhere. And this was just another pile of stones. But it was very big, and there was a lot of Israelite pottery mixed in it. So Adam Zertal says, I have to come and excavate. 1982, first season of excavation. They excavate from 1982 till 1989. And what they do is they bring a, bring a crew, and the crew peels off the outer layer of stone. And out of it emerges a mysterious structure, a rectangular um, structure of some sort made of uncut stones. <laughs> and leading to it is a ramp, not stairs. A ramp. And on both sides of that ramp are two secondary ramps. Okay, it's, maybe it's a bit hard to see it here. So here we have a diagram of that structure. And what we see is, again, we see a, a rectangular box um, that was sealed with stones and a ramp going up to it and two double ramps on both sides of the major ramp. And um, Adam Zertal is excavating, right? This is not the survey. So excavating from top to bottom. He opens up that box. It's like when you get a birthday par present, you open the box. So he opens the box, and inside he finds two meters of ashes and bones. Weird. We're, there's nothing here. It's a remote site. No villages, no towns around, and suddenly there is a room 
filled with ashes and bones. Weird. They send the bones to be analyzed in the Hebrew University, and the results come in. All the bones belong to a very specific and limited list of animals, goats, sheep, oxes, cows. They're all young. They're all male. Really weird, because when you go to a, 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 an archaeological site, an ancient archaeological site, a city or a village, you find bones of old animals, because these are the animals that were slaughtered. Young animals, that's weird. But also the fact that they didn't find bones of other animals, like pigs and donkeys and horses, which are very common in Philistine and Canaanite sites. Okay, the, all the criteria of the Torah, of the Bible, fit. But Adam Zertal is, a monoth is, 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 is an atheist archaeologist. He doesn't believe in the, the, the history. This could not have, have, a, have existed in the, in the year 13, 3,300 years BCE. This could, uh, sorry, uh, 1,300 BCE. This could not have existed then because the Torah was written much later, right? No. But that's what he thought. He continues on to excavate all the way down to the bedrock, and he finds at the center of that box, the rectangular box, a circular installation of some sort at the center of the box. So just to like summarize this, the history of the structure, someone, 3,300 years ago, came to this remote slope. He built this circular installation. This is the first layer. Then, at a certain point, they built this bigger structure with a ramp and with a box. And after 60 or 70 years of use, they cover it with stone. These are the three layers. What else do they find there? Egyptian jewelry. They find scarabs, Egyptian scarabs, which are these Egyptian luck charms that help us date the site. They also find a stone dice. They find a pumice chalice, which is used for spiritual uh, ceremonies. This is a, an incense, a small incense altar. Another one like that was found Guess where? In the Sinai. Weird. And they also found lots of pieces of plaster. Really weird. Adam Zertal is an archaeologist. What does an archaeologist do? When he finds a structure he can't explain, he goes to the libraries. He looks at the Assyrian, the Babylonian cultures, the Egyptian culture. He's trying to find parallels to this weird looking structure. By the way, another amazing video, <laughs> drone video that I took. And, and he can't find any parallel. And he's sitting at the dining hall of the town of Shavei Shomron, and he's sketching this weird structure that he found and he doesn't know what it is. And suddenly a, an Orthodox Jew comes back, comes behind him, and he sees this weird structure. And he says, Professor Zertal, is this what you found on Mount Ibal? And Zertal looks at him and says, yes, I, I don't know what it is. I looked everywhere, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt. There's only one place he didn't look at, right? I looked everywhere, couldn't find anything. And then he sees this Jew this Orthodox Jew, Tzvi, all excited. And then he, started, he runs away. And he sees the dust <laughs> flying from the floor. What's going on here? And this religious Jew comes back with a book. OK, this book is called the Mishnah. The Mishnah is, was a, is a Jewish book that was written after the time of Jesus, after the Second Temple period. They opened the book. And he shows him a sketch of the second temple altar. 
And Adam Zertal is looking at this, and he sees a rectangular box. This is the altar of the second temple, so there should be bones and ashes in that box. Uh, but, but what's interesting is, is there's also a ramp going up to it, and two secondary ramps on both sides. Adam Zertal is looking at these, these two pictures, this sketch and, and this book, and he can't believe his, his eyes. He found an Israelite altar, one of a kind in the land of Israel. At this point, Zertal's life collapses. All his education, all his beliefs just chatter on the floor. He looks at Tzvi and he says, Tzvi, this Orthodox Jew, Tzvi, this is an Israelite altar on Mount Ibal, the biggest we ever found. It has to be Joshua's altar. And if this is Joshua's altar, then Joshua existed. And Moses existed. And the Exodus happened. And Tzvi looks at him, this Orthodox Jew, and says, of course. <laughs> now, Adam Zertal describes in his book, A Nation Born, they, they didn't sleep for three days after this. All the volunteers that were with him from Japan and from Norway just sat all night talking about this. They found Joshua's altar. Adam Zertal thought that the academic world, with integrity, will understand that it was wrong, that they will admit and ask for forgiveness. You think it happened? No. Because you have a lot of professors that made careers and wrote books. They can't say they were wrong, but they can't argue with this. So what do they do? They ignore it. Most of them. Some of them say, if there is an altar on Mount Ibal, as Ertal claims, we biblical scholars should all go back to kindergarten. <laughs> Who wants to fund the buses? <laughs> for the care, you have to buy, you need buses for the kindergarten. You can't just let them walk by themselves, right? This is where I would usually finish my lecture. But thankfully, in 2019, we found something. And this is where I'm going to share with you now. But before we do that, a brief history between 1989, the last season of excavation, and 2019. First of all, every major archaeological excavation needs a final report. The final report is bringing the data to the academic world to peer review. That's when it becomes a fact in the academic world. The problem is that there was, until today, Adam Zertal's discovery of the altar doesn't have a final report. Why is that? Because to write a final report, you need money. But what happens if you're an archaeologist that is excavating a biblical site that might prove the Bible? What happens when you're excavating in Judea and Samaria, a place that the left wing and the academic world, who is left wing leaning, sees as an area that shouldn't be controlled by the, people, by the, land, by the state of Israel? You lose your funding. You apply for a grant, you don't get it. I have good news. Half a year ago, we got six, we had got half a million shekels. As we speak, the final report is being written, and it will be ready in a few months. What are the other things that are happening? Israel signs the Oslo Agreements in the 1990s, and the whole region of the biblical heartland of Israel becomes 
cut. There are borders everywhere between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. A certain archaeologist in the Israeli army makes sure that the border between full Israeli control and partial Palestinian control passes close to the altar, putting the altar on the Palestinian side. So we can't research it anymore. In the last few years, I've been visiting the altar on a weekly basis, and every week I see the site deteriorating. The Arabs are coming, they're graffitiing on the altar, they're burning tires inside of it, they're pushing the stones of the altar inside that box, and they're destroying it purposely. And I'm looking at this and my heart breaks because this is the love of my life, this site. Every time I stand there, I cry. I touch my heritage. And I see my heritage being destroyed. I had to, I had to do something. I went to Dr. Shai Bar, who replaced Adam Zertel after his passing away. And I said, Shai, we have to do something. What, what can we do? And Shai, Dr. Shai Bao told me, Aaron, I can't do anything. If I touch the altar, my academic career is gone. There's fear in the academic world. Can you, can you imagine? There's fear. So I said to Shai, what happens if I bring a foreign archaeologist? I met Dr. Scott Tripling um, while he was excavating in Shiloh. And I told him, Dr. Scott, have you ever been to Joshua's altar? And he said, no. I said, do you want to go? He said, yes. Let's go. Volume? Help, I need somebody help. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Aaron Lipkin and I'm here with Dr. Scott Stripling. Hello everybody. And just behind us is one of the most amazing archaeological yep. structures that were discovered, Joshua's altar. Um, Scott, what, what, what can you say about this? Well, this is one of the most incredible sites in Israel. It ties in with the earliest Israelite heritage and this, this rectangular altar was built by people who wanted to venerate what God had done in this place. Underneath it is a, a round altar that we're interested in exploring also. When, when people come to a place like this, they connect with their faith heritage. And when we... Scott fell in love with Joshua's altar. <clears throat> like I planned. <laughs> and... Um, and I said, Scott, what can we do? How can we save this site? And Scott said, Aaron, I can't excavate here. Just like Shai, I cannot receive a license from the Israeli government to excavate here. And I will not ask the Palestinian Authority to give me a, a license. But what we can do, he's a, he's a Texan archaeologist, OK, from Houston. What we can do is you can bring the archaeological dump of Professor Adam Zertal from the 1980s. Okay, When you excavate, you check the soil and the, the findings, and then you throw what's not needed to the side. That's the dump. So Aaron, you go to the dump, you extract the dump, bring it to a safe location. I will come with my crew, and we will wet sift it. Okay, what's wet sifting? Putting the dump, the material, in, on a sifter, a, a net, wash it with water, and maybe we'll find something. Okay, Adam Zertal didn't wet sift, only dry sifted. When you wet sift, you find a lot of things. If you only dry sift, you lose 75% of the findings. So, 
I heard Scott and I said, yeehaw. <laughs> He's a Texan, so I have to speak in his language. So first, first stage is to bring my drone and to take a video of um, go back. So this is the the western. This is the eastern dump. You see the altar. This is the eastern dump. That that big pile of rubble that you saw. And uh, for some reason, it's not continuing. It's okay. Um, and and so I, I I located the dumps, and I sent all the material to Scott. He told me, gave me directions exactly what to do, and the next stage was to come with volunteers. Hard here. These are Christian volunteers that helped us. Uh, we came three times uh, after speaking to the Israeli army and the mayor of Samaria. Uh, we, we came there at 4 in the morning, at uh, 5.30 when the sun comes, starts to come up. I put my prayer shawl on and my tefillin. This is the first day of the extraction and I'm looking to the heavens like my grandfather, but not in Arabic. And I'm saying, God, give us something. Give us like this huge finding that will just, boom. And God listened to my prayer. So, we brought the, the, the material to Shavei Shamron. Scott Stripling comes with his crew. They establish the wet sifting stations, and they start working on the material. After three days, phone call. Scott is calling me. He says, Aaron, get over here. I go into my car, and I drive. And I'm so, so curious. And I get there. And Scott opens his hand. And I see this square looking piece of I don't know what in his hand. And I say, Scott, what is this? And he says, Aaron, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a piece of metal of some sort. I've seen it in the past, in later periods, the Persian period, the Hellenistic period, the Roman period. These are curse tablets. Um, and so this might be from the Roman period or the Persian period. Who knows? But in our hearts, we knew that there's a very good chance that this is from a much earlier period. Because Joshua's altar is a one-layer site. Okay? It's not like Jerusalem where you go and you have layers upon layers of civilizations and histories and religions and ethnicities, one on top of the other. Joshua's altar is a remote site that was used only once in history for 60 or 70 years and then abandoned. And so when we find something there, there are good chances that it's from the right period. Scott sends this small tablet to the university. What they see is a piece of metal, a piece of lead that was folded. So what do they try to do? Open it. But it starts breaking, so they stop. The next thing is to look for a technology that will enable us to scan the outside, but also the inside, without opening it physically like a CAT scan, okay, or something called tomography. Czech Republic, Academy of Sciences, we do CAT scans to archaeological findings. Let's do this. Yep. Yeah. This is the machine that scanned this small piece, small piece of tiny, tiny, tiny lead tablet from all directions inside and outside. And uh, we started receiving the scans from the Czech Republic. Scott is sending this 
to academic to professors that he's working with. And just a few months ago, he calls me and he says, Aaron, we identified text, ancient Hebrew. We recognize at least clearly at least one letter, the letter Aleph, the first Hebrew letter in the uh, Hebrew alphabet. We're waiting for more news to come. And then Scott says, Aaron, we're doing a press conference. We have the full text. Ready? First of all, I'd like to say a word about Aaron Lipkin. It was Aaron and I who originally dreamed or brainstormed this idea on the last day of the Shiloh excavation in 2019. And um, it was going to take someone on that end to logistically help pull things off to, to relocate the dump material and just do so many logistical things. And so Aaron and I dreamed about this. And uh, so it was that initial collaboration that was key to bringing this to fruition. So thank you, Aaron. Working on the inside of the tablet, <clears throat> we recovered 40 Hebrew letters. And uh, this is in a script that we would call proto-alphabetic script. Uh, sometimes if it's from the, the Sinai, it's referred to as proto-Sinaitic, or sometimes folks would refer to this as proto-Canaanite. We will call it proto-alphabetic script. Eleven of these letters are alephs, the first letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and they are all the archaic form. This is older than Paleo-Hebrew. This precedes, predates Paleo-Hebrew. And so you have an ox head that is morphing into, into an aleph. And in the 23-word English translation, which you're looking at, the word curse, arur in Hebrew, appears 10 times. And ladies and gentlemen, the name Yahweh appears twice. We now have the name Yahweh, the, the biblical God of Israel, in an inscription dating from LB2, which is earlier than many skeptics would argue that the Bible existed or that there was even the ability to write down a sacred text. Okay, this is uh, Stuart Peck from Appian Media. Yes, we did excavate through about 30% of the material, Stu, and uh, we would love to excavate through more, and um, hopefully we will have generous donors that will enable us to do that. Uh, this, this is all, of course, a very expensive process, and we would love to do more work on Mount Eval uh, in the future. This was the test, if you will, to find out what was in the dump piles, and we, uh, the day that Aaron Lipkin and I, last day we went to look at the site to inaugurate the project, as we pulled away and stopped and looked back, uh, it had rained a little earlier, and there was a rainbow over the altar, and uh, instead of a pot of gold, we found a pot of lead at the end of the rainbow. Okay. Uh, I spoke to Professor Gershon Galil, one of the philologists, uh, just three weeks ago. And um, he said, Aaron, we further examined the text and we updated it, further analysis. And I'm going to present to you the updated text that we currently have. But first of all, it's important to, to understand that when you look at the piece of lead, what you see is the following. Someone, 3,300 years ago, took a stylus. By the way, we found three styluses in the dump. He took a stylus and he engraved on the upper part of that lead strip of metal, okay? He engraves. And so when you engrave something, you have a negative and a positive because it comes out on the other side, right? So if you don't understand something, you look at the other side, right? So the scribe writes a curse, a terrible curse on the upper part, and then he flips the metal and he writes on the bottom part the same text. So we have a negative and a positive. And after engraving this, he folds it. So we have two negative copies and two positive copies. Okay, the scribe 3,300 years ago said, I know that one day there are going to be academics that are going to say that we didn't know how to write, so I'm just going to do it four times. 
And if there's going to be a misunderstanding about what I wrote, well, it's going to be clear after they read it four times. You understand? Okay. So let's look at this terrible curse. By the way, in Hebrew, it's even scarier. This is how it sounds in Hebrew. Ata arur lael Hashem arur. Tamut arur, arur mot tamut, arur ata le Hashem arur. Okay, we don't say the name of the Lord, we say Hashem. In English, you are cursed by the God, Hashem, cursed. You will die cursed, cursed you will surely die, cursed you are by Hashem, cursed. Before we go into this text and understand what's going on here, we need to do another crash course. I gave you a crash course in archaeology, now a crash course in ancient Hebrew. What you see on the upper line is modern Hebrew. Okay? You recognize it? Modern Hebrew. The lowest line is Second Temple Hebrew. This is how they wrote during the time of Jesus. Okay, when you look at the Second Temple Dead Sea Scrolls, that's the font that they're using. Okay? If you go further back in history to the time of Hezekiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they're writing in a different font. That's the second from the bottom. It's called Phoenician, or Paleo-Hebrew. If you go further back to that, to the time of Joshua and Moses, it's a different font. What's called proto-alphabetic font. What is proto-alphabetic font, also called hieroglyphic Hebrew? Every letter has a picture, just like Egyptian hieroglyphs. But unlike Egyptian hieroglyphs, it's an alphabet. In other words, every letter has a picture. Whereas in Egypt, one sign could be a whole sentence. Okay, so it's an alphabet. And every sign reminds us of the letter. For example, the letter D, or Dalet in Hebrew, comes from the word Dag, which is a fish. Okay, the hand is Yad. That's Yud, Y. Kaf, K in Hebrew, is a kaf yad, a hand. Okay, so you have all these signs. These are the signs that were found in the lead tablet. It's the earliest form of Hebrew fonts. So, how does the word, how does the name of the Lord appear? Weird, isn't it? We have the name of the Lord, but the direction is reading from left to right. You guys were right all along. Okay? No, just kidding. We're right. No, just kidding. When you look at ancient texts from that time, it could be right to left, it could be left to right, and it could be right to left and then left to right. At the same text. Okay, so at that time, the time of Joshua, the time of Moses, the time of even King David, the direction wasn't standardized. So what you see here is the name of the Lord from left to right. We have the Yud on the left. We have in the middle a man standing saying, Hey! That's Hey. And we have another letter on the left called Vav. Yud, Hey, Vav. Okay? Now, let's dive into the text. Let's do this quickly. Whoops. Okay, so we have 48 letters inside, 46 letters outside, total of 94 letters. This is a small piece of lead. I have no idea how they did that. Okay? Really, really, really small. Uh, the name of Hashem appears four times. 
the names Hashem and El, two names of God, appear together on the same text, on one copy. The second copy, only Hashem, without El. Okay, we have both, these are two, the, this is the only difference between the two copies. Um, we have a, a, a scribe that is a poet. It's not just a, a terrible curse, it's written in a very special form called chiastic parallelism. And the letters, the words are vowelized and unvowelized, and this is also interesting. And this is the most ancient version of Hebrew font. Initial conclusions. When, jo when, when Adam Zertel found the altar, those minimalists said, oh, it's a watchtower, it's a Canaanite barbecue stand. <laughs> the Israelites never came here, they weren't here, they didn't exist. Well, guess what? They were here. <laughs> and they worshipped the Lord, Hashem. Okay? Now, why is this weird? Because in the academic world, they believe that the worship of Yud Hei Vav, Hashem, only started later, at the eight, 800 years or 700 year BCE. Okay? The Israelites earlier, if they existed, worshipped El and other, other deities, other pagan deities. But the worship of Hashem only started later on. Well, guess what? No! <laughs> Both names of the same God appear during the time of Joshua and Moses. This is clearly an, an Israelite site, not the Canaanite site or not whatever. This is a, a, an Israelite site because it's Hebrew and they're worshiping Hashem, so it's, it's Israelite. Um, we have a possible strong connection to the ceremony of the blessings and the curses. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, and uh, the metal itself uh, was analyzed and they found that it came from Greece and uh, from quarries that worked in the late bronze and early iron age. So here we have another way of dating that piece of lead. And clearly this is an Israelite altar because the metal, the lead tablet came from inside the altar. Adam Zertel excavated the inside, sifted it, and threw it out. But it came from inside the altar. Okay, so the altar is Israelite, both belonging to the Israelite ethnicity and the Israelite religion. This is fun. Okay, now, what I'm going to share with you is not the facts. Okay, because when you excavate, you have the facts, we have a text with words, right? That's the facts. But then there's the interpretation. And what I'm thinking is this could be a very angry Israelite woman that is writing a curse on her, hus on her husband. <laughs> this could be one of the claims of the professors in the academic world after they published this in full. This is just uh, someone who wanted to kill his neighbor, okay? This, is, this could be a claim. What I'm looking is for any hint that this could be part of the ceremony of the blessings and the curses of Joshua. Because we are talking about Mount Ibal, right. which is the mountain of curses. curses. And this is a very valuable piece of metal that an expert scribe wrote on 94 Hebrew letters. That's a really angry woman. <laughs> or not. I don't think so. Okay, so what I'm going to share with you is my insights on how this tablet could be connected to the ceremony. So, let's browse through this. Folded lead tablet is a sign for a legal document, okay? This is a, an ancient tradition in the Middle East. When you write something and you fold it, it's legal, okay? So this is not an angry 
woman, okay? This is a, a legal declaration of some sort. We have six cursed on one side and six on the other. Remember the tribes standing on both sides of the mountains? Interesting. We have a total of 12 curses, just like Deuteronomy 27. We have a high-skilled scribe, both in craftsmanship and authorship. We have curse in the singular, just like in Deuteronomy 27. Yeah. Okay, so Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 27, it says, cursed be the man. It's, it's in singular. And here we have a curse that is in the singular form. In other words, if, this, if I'm right, and this is part of the ceremony of the blessings and the curses, this is a, a physical implication, a physical symbolizing of the actual curse that was set there. And it's on each and every Israelite. This is a self-imprecatory curse. And it came from inside the altar, which means it was important. And the Israelites wanted to, to guard it, to put it in a safe and a sacred place. I believe that all these things together make it very clear that there is a strong connection between the tablet and the ceremony. Do you agree with me? Yes. Okay. Now, the great thing about archaeology is we don't need archaeological proof to believe in God. Amen? Amen. But when we find something, it's exciting. But I think that for a Bible believer, the great thing is that after you find something, suddenly you look at the Bible and you find things you never noticed. Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do now, there's a lead tablet with ancient Israelite scripture on it. Let's see if we can find anything in the Bible that talks about writing on metal, writing on lead tablets. Maybe we'll find something, right? You heard of Job? book of Job, that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. We have inscribing on lead, and Job is one of the oldest books in the Bible, okay? And writing on lead is writing forever, not on parchments, but writing on a metal that will exist forever. This is an eternal Vow. Okay? Zechariah. We have two prophecies. A prophecy about a flying scroll. This is the, the curse that is going out over the whole land. And then we have another prophecy that talks about a cover that made out of lead that is covering a cursed woman. Okay, so what do we understand from here? Lead is associated with curse. Unlike other metals, such as gold, the high priest had a golden plate on his head that said, holy to the Lord. Okay, so gold is a good metal. Yeah. Now, if we're talking about the priests, I want to share an exciting insight that I just got in the last week. Ready? Okay. When we go to synagogue and we pray in the morning, there is a certain part that is the most important part in the prayer. During the 18 benediction prayer, the descendants of Aaron, the priests, the Kohanim, they approach the front of the synagogue. They cover themselves with prayer shawls. These are the priests, the, 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 the descendants of Aaron, the Kohenim. And they look at the ark at the front of the synagogue. And under the talus, under the prayer shawl, they go with their hands like this. And they, they bless a blessing. 
And after they finish the blessing, they turn around to the congregation and they bless the congregation with the ironic blessing. I'm telling you, we always have people talking during the prayer. Okay, gossiping, and everybody does that. But during the ironic blessing, everybody's quiet because they want that blessing. And, and sometimes you'll see fathers covering their children with the talus and putting their, their hands on their heads to bring that blessing to their children. So what I'm going to show you now is one of the most important events in the Jewish calendar, the priestly blessing at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. Just want to show you how it looks like. As a kid, 
And as a grown-up, when you stand and see this, you're, you're, you have so many questions. Where did this come from? Where did this custom, this ancient custom of, of, of standing with your hands like this, where did it come from? It always, it was always, always intrigued me. But I think I have an answer. We are commanded to bless our children every Friday night. And what we bless them is the Aaronic blessing. Now when the priests come, they say, when we, when we read the Aaronic blessing in the Bible, it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So the commandment to the priests is to put God's name on the Israelites. Here's my theory. God's name was written in a certain way. And that way is a person standing like this and signifying with his two other hands the other two letters on both sides. So the priests, when they're doing this, they're basically writing God's name and putting it on the congregation. Now, let's finish. There's one question that you didn't ask me. What's going on? If I was God, if I was Moses, and I was commanding the Israelites to build an altar to God, I would command them to build it on the mountain of blessing. It's a good mountain, right? No. God is telling them to build it on the mountain of curses. Why? Here's my answer. The ceremony of the blessings and the curses is God's way of telling us you have a freedom of choice. Okay? You can be righteous. You can choose to walk in my way. And you will be blessed. But you also have the option of choosing otherwise. You have the, way, the, the, the choice to go and not to go according to my, to my way, way, to my commandments. But know that if that happens, you will be cursed. But you have, you have options. Okay, that's, that's the, the major message. Why then is the altar built on the mountain of curses? I think God is saying the following. If you're righteous and you chose to go to Mount Gerizim and receive blessings, good for you. But if you chose to be a sinner, if you chose not to walk in God's way, and you're cursed, and you feel that, and your heart aches, and you cry to God, save me. The altar of God is waiting for the sinner on the mountain of curse. The altar is God's beacon to show the sinner the right way to righteousness. The altar is repentance. The altar is the place of atonement. And so God is saying, I want you. I don't want you to die. I don't want you to be cursed. I want you to come closer to me, to be with me. This is from Ezekiel. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down 
and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Thank you.